Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Just Add Champagne. I'm very excited for this episode as we will be covering sparkling cocktails with bubbles, which I think will be wonderful for the spring season. Spring, it starts on Saturday, and I think we're all ready for it, especially with these recent storms that have come through. Susie, I know that you and I both were, you know, <laughs> we were really in it with the snowstorm that went through Texas you know, a couple of weeks yes. ago. And I mean, now that the sun is shining, the weather is better, I think we're all breathing a collective sigh of relief. But before, Just a bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but before we get started, I wanted to take a moment just to silence to recognize what happened in our country this week and reach out to our friends in the Asian American and Pacific Islander community just to say that we are your allies, we are here for you, we see you, and reach out to us if you need anything because we will be reaching out to you even if it is just something simple like a text message. We care about you deeply and we want to make sure that you feel safe within your own life. Now, Getting into the actual event of today, um, just as a reminder for those of you who may be new to Just Add Champagne as an event as in general, this we use everything that we normally use with Zoom. So if you have questions during the course of the experience, please feel free to put them either in the chat, which I'll be moderating, or also in the Q&A section, and we will answer those as we go. If, there, if you want to use the chat function, make sure that you definitely put to everyone so that everyone can see what it is that you want to know because they might want to know it too. And then that way we can actually call you out because we love to share experiences with everyone and we will have some polls as well throughout the course of the experience. And it looks like the chat is already open and Stu is saying, hi, Elise and hi, Susie. <laughs> hi, Dad. <laughs> oh my gosh, hi. hi. Always nice to have the support of the family as we go, of course, with every episode. But without further ado, I would really love for my guest to introduce herself, my good friend, and who I like to call my partner in wine and beverage enthusiasm, Susie O. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, and I was getting a little bit of feedback, so I think, okay, we're good. All good here. <laughs> Hi, y'all. I'm Susie, um, Susie Drinks on Instagram and my website. Um, and yes, I was lucky enough to, to meet our, uh, our wonderful Elise here. Uh, a couple years ago at Tales of the Cocktail, um, and I am so excited to be on here today. I've been watching these and following along and so excited to get my invitation. <laughs> so I'm um, really excited to go through and make a couple cocktails with you guys today um, using these beautiful sparkling wines, champagnes even. <laughs> um, and uh, I guess we have, we have plenty to go over. I love this run of show. I am so excited to get into some of these topics because <laughs> there's um, definitely some controversial stuff in there. You know, the whole spritz summer situation. I'm very excited to talk about. <laughs> Excellent. Well, and that's why I wanted you to be a guest, especially when talking about cocktails, because to me, you have such a great story about, you know, coming from the, the realm of PR and social media consulting, and then really taking a leap of faith and going into business for yourself and following your passion. You know, that's something mm. that not many people get to do in their nine to five, which for us, it's not really nine to five. It's kind of 24, seven, 365, 366, depending on the year. <laughs> so it's wonderful that we get to share your perspective and really kind of see like what, you know, what that journey has been been like for you. And I have shared your website in the chat for anyone who is new and doesn't and hasn't actually gone to your website yet. But it all started here in Dallas, right? Yes. Um, oh, is are you hearing that too? Sorry, I just want to make sure I'm not blowing everybody's ears out. Um, so yes, I started as Suzy Drinks Dallas and I was doing Dallas Happy Hour Reviews. My website is still Suzy Drinks Dallas. Um, but my Instagram now is just Suzy Drinks because I drink a lot of other places too. Um, I was just a little bit bored in my first job and decided I needed a hobby. I was sitting with my dad one day having a margarita and I told him I just, I needed some hobby that I could take up, but something that was going to be productive and at some point maybe make me money. And he looked at me as plain as day and said, do what you do well, drink and write. And here we are. <laughs> Um, so now I'm, I'm getting to judge spirits awards and travel and it's been pretty incredible. Um, and yeah, about five and a half years ago, I went out on my own. Um, and so I'm a social media consultant by day and drink writer by night and sometimes drink writer by day. <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, it's been quite nice. an adventure. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and what was the biggest revelation for you when you kind of became your own boss? Because I think the idea of entrepreneurship, especially during COVID, when a lot of people had to maybe figure out the idea of the side hustle, how to make money if they were unemployed or, you know, furloughed or something of that nature. So being, you know, like a hashtag boss babe, you know, what does that mean for you and what have you experienced? So I think it shouldn't matter if you're a lady or a gentleman, but um it has definitely been challenging in ways I didn't expect. I knew it was going to be harder work because I had to rely on myself for everything. But the hardest part has actually been being a self-starter and um, convincing myself that, yes, while I have the opportunity to go do happy hour at 2 p.m., I should probably finish my, ar my article that's due or edit the photos that I just took and, you know, still wait until five for happy hour. <laughs> Or heck, have happy hour at two and then work until midnight. <laughs> I mean, wherever you can fit it in, if that's, you know, your, the way that your biological clock works, you know, throughout the day, then more power mm -hmm. to you. Because I've read a lot of your articles. Obviously, I've come to a lot of your events that you host. And all of them, just there's a lot of joy behind it. And you can see it and the attention to detail. I mean, let's what I mean, we can talk about the joint birthday party that we threw. Like, I mean, that was a next level kind of experience. And I know that it takes a certain kind of person to be able to really take an idea and make it come to life like that. So I'm sure I speak on behalf of many of your clients and, of course, a lot of your friends where we all say that we're all pretty enamored, you know, with what you're <laughs> able to do day by day. And it's just been fun to be able to be a part of the conversation since moving to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been delighted to have you by my side. And you, you did bring up the Buffett bash. You brought it up. It happened. So it happened. Elise and I have birthdays very close to each other. And so I guess coming up on two years ago, uh, we decided we were going to have a giant tiki tailgate. And it was perhaps one of the most fun days of my life. <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll have to... Pray that, you know, Jimmy Buffett's coming back through Dallas sometime around our birthdays again so we could do a repeat party. <laughs> I agree. Bigger and better than before. I mean, that was so much fun. And you created and all the And GH was present. <laughs> it was. And you created a lot of the cocktails there with some, a few friends of ours, Ariel and, you know, Betty Cocktail, Chris, who yes. I love her Instagram as well. And so, you know, since we're talking about cocktail culture and we're talking about sparkling cocktails today, do you have a favorite sparkling cocktail? You know, I do love a French 75. Um, this past week, I actually made one, though, um, with the rosé sparkling, and it just was a nice, refreshing, well, refreshing in that it was different, because um, a French 75 is a classic cocktail, and you don't you do see variations on it, but putting the rosé on it was just such an easy way to kind of up the game there and have something a little bit different that looked gorgeous. So I think that might actually be one of my new favorite sparklings. I do remember the first sparkling cocktail I ever made that I thought was groundbreaking. I made a classic champagne cocktail, which is quite literally champagne. And then you take a sugar cube and put bitters on it and drop it in. That's it. I thought I was so clever whenever I made that for one of my sister's birthdays forever ago. Uh, but looking back, I've come a long way. <laughs> the classics are classic for a reason. And, you there know, you of go. course, a lot of those flavors go together for you know, in, in kind of in, infinity, you know. So it's always nice to see that what it meant that you had good taste, essentially, right? <laughs> Because if well, that's we'll where you started it. and that's where we go from, then obviously you know how to make a good cocktail. So there are a lot of trends that are going on right now within the cocktail community in general, um, but of course also with sparkling because, it's, you know, things like Spike Seltzer are going crazy. I mean, there's so many brands out there, big people like AB InBev, you know, like they're actually investing into things like this. And so I'm curious kind of what you've been seeing since you often have your finger on, on the pulse of a lot of the trends and then actually get to do the research and write about them. What are some of your thoughts on the sparkling cocktail trends that are coming up? And we can kind of like go through some of the particular topics as we go, but are you like, are you a fan of Spike Seltzer? I am actually, uh, it has its place. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's very portable. It definitely has its place. Um, but 
Uh, you know, I, I think the really interesting thing is, and I'm, I'm not going to drop any names here, but I was in Houston this past weekend talking to um, a bar owner down there and, you know, our, our time change. And so we ended up um, out drinking till 3 a.m. And <laughs> I just, I thought it was so funny. Her choice was a white claw because she was like, this is where I am at the night. And I loved it actually, because I was like, all right, a little 5% option right there. And um, I, I actually joined in. I, I, I went with the White Claw. It happened. Because um, sometimes you just need just a little bit of flavor, a little bit of bubbles. <laughs> and you're not ready to open up a whole bottle of champagne for the rest of the night. So. It's true. Well, and I think a lot of the kind of low ABV trend is definitely catching on and sparkling wine in general, it's not necessarily low ABV. What I've seen is that I mean, it's not something that is actually, you know, mandated, like there aren't any regulations behind it, but typically within the wine world, anything that's between like seven and 10% is probably mm -hmm. low ABV. So with sparkling, you're normally at like 11 or 12. Um, so definitely kind of on the cusp of that category. But then as you blend it with other things, of course, the actual ABV content will go down just based on the amount of ingredients. So, but it's one of those things where you can have more than one, you know, without feeling the same effects of one particular drink, especially if it's very spirit heavy. So, yes, for uh, sure. I mean, especially at restaurants, you're seeing a lot more mocktail options, which is very cool. You know, when my sister was pregnant, I mean, obviously I wanted to be able to make cocktails for her while I was enjoying my glass of wine, because you never want anyone to feel left out. So it's nice to see that there, you know, there are options for that out there now. But there are some other trends that are particularly, I mean, to me, almost comical, and we've actually experienced them together. So within sparkling cocktails, also including edible glitter. Now, tell me what your feelings are about that. And maybe even the drink that we had when we were in New Orleans after stopping by um, <laughs> to get beignets. Um, so... Let's see, edible yeah. glitter. Um, I think that there, again, is a time and a place for it. Um, you, I mean, you've seen it in so many things now. People are just throwing it on top as, you know, and a garnish, which is nice. Um, I've been actually really intrigued by the edible glitter cocktails that have sparkling elements in them. So something that is going to actually continue to effervesce and release more of the, the carbon dioxide. So then it then keeps agitating the glitter and continues to be beautiful. I think that's the way to go with those. Um, obviously, if you want somebody sitting there shaking up their cocktails, that just sounds like a mess. But um, <laughs> I think um, overall, I'm, I'm not not a fan of them. Uh, I think that uh, some of the ways people are trying to just make them make the cocktail is not, not worth it. Um, if you're going to use it as a nice little extra element, great, but don't make a terrible cocktail, throw edible glitter in it, and then get everybody to fall in love with it, because that's not what we need. <laughs> it's kind of like the unicorn frappuccino, right? You know, like, it looks really cool, but does it taste good? We're not really sure. <laughs> but I agree, it's very visually stimulating. I mean, I've seen a lot of these on Instagram recently with edible glitter being used, like, for people's cocktail programs, and it is kind of mesmerizing to watch it kind of circulate around the glass, and you're like, Oh, <laughs> kind of harkens back to some of the knickknacks that we would have in our rooms growing up, right? <laughs> oh my gosh, for sure. And I think uh, I, I'm seeing a question come through, is edible good or trying too hard? And uh, some people, yes. Um, the people that don't, again, the people that make the whole cocktail about the glitter, that's trying too hard. We don't need that. <laughs> um, but the people who are using it thoughtfully or just as a light dusting on the top, because there are different kinds. You can get the kind that you put in the cocktail and it's um, meant to look like uh, almost metallic. I think those are really neat. Um, and then you have the ones that you dust on top. And if you're going to do the ones that you dust on top, just don't get the rainbow ones. Like go with a solid metallic, please. <laughs> I think that's probably a very good insider tip because I feel like the more colors that are included, the more muddled it might become and you won't get that same kind of wow factor. I remember you using one of those products. I think that the one that you had was either a gold or a copper color and you were using it with a dry shake cocktail. So you had this beautiful palette of white foam on top. It looked fantastic. And honestly, it did augment the drink versus taking away from it. And so I think when used with precision, that stuff, stuff like this is definitely something where people can kind of take their cocktails to the next level in terms of artistry 
kind of like what people do with garnish. You know, it's just kind of another mm -hmm. addition with fancy garnish, you know, especially within the tiki community. That's always a fun kind of contest to see who can be the most outlandish with their fruit. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, if, if I remember correctly, the one you're referring to was a a, a friend of my sister's had challenged me to a cocktail competition over Christmas. Yes. <laughs> and I decided that I needed to have gold edible glitter on top of my foam and it didn't behave like I wanted it to. <laughs> so it ended up getting everywhere. It was such a mess, but you know, the picture in the end looked all right. <laughs> and I, I won. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what really matters, right? Like <laughs> So we talked a little bit about low ABV, but you also mentioned spritz for the summer. So, you know, this is something that's been gaining traction for like the last four years or so, I would say. When I was doing some of my back research, I saw that Hakkasan, which is a nationwide restaurant um, group, they said that at one point, the Aperol spritz actually eclipsed rosé in terms of overall sales on the menu, which I thought was incredible because especially in the summer, rosé, I feel like is the number one thing that's ordered, especially now that people are doing frosé cocktails and things of that nature. So that was super interesting to me. And then I went further down the rabbit hole and I saw that even like the idea of that Aperol color, that super vibrant orange was a hair trend. <laughs> following that and that was in 2020 and so for someone like me it's like wow like the fact that a spirit can really impact so much of actual pop culture and then of course of people's buying habits was super interesting to me so you know like how often are you ordering spritzes and how often are you seeing them on menus here in Dallas and then when you're traveling I have to say I see a spritz almost on every menu now. Um, you, I, I, would, I would venture to say that on true cocktail menus, there's gonna be some sort of a signature spritz at almost every place that you go to, at the higher end places at least. Um, it's just because it's, it's an approachable cocktail. It's an easy low ABV that people can get behind. Um, I actually really applaud the low ABV cocktail movement um, and the no ABV cocktail movement. I mean, gotta take your hat off to those wonderful spirits companies that are making faux spirits. Um, Seed Lip is definitely one of my favorites to use. They have just such deep flavors anyway, um, but back to the spritz. Um, I do absolutely love that it's something that people can, you know, have a few of on a long summer day, whenever you're out having a long, let's say Sunday fun day, um, and it doesn't affect you as much. And I, I applaud whoever started that trend because I'm, I, I think we needed it, <laughs> quite honestly. Um, but then beyond that, I think, um, you know, there, there's so much flavor packed into it too for being a, such a simple cocktail. Um, and I, I am a fan. I'll, I'll have one probably every couple of weeks, even in the, in the winter. I made a, um, a different kind of take on the spritz uh, when we had the big for the big storm, uh, my my mom was staying with me because her water was out. And so I was like, get your boots. We're going to the park. We're going to do a video. We're going to make a Scandinavian spritz. <laughs> and we did. Um, so I, I really love that um, it started with the Aperol spritz, but it's really starting to um, morph a little bit and evolve into other options also. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan. <laughs> Absolutely. And typically a spritz, especially an Aperol spritz, is used with Prosecco, which is a very bubbly, um, champ you know, a very bubbly sparkling wine. And so that's actually why it does really well when you start building on top of it, because the bubbles don't get totally lost within the cocktail itself. So, but then the first, like you said, it's a very simple cocktail. There's not a whole lot that you have to build with it, but there is a lot of flavor. So the first cocktail that we're going to make today that Susie is going to demo is actually also very simple in terms of the amount of ingredients, but definitely a showstopper. And it is a sparkling Negroni. And I have to say that my husband and I have had so many Negronis over the course of the pandemic. It kind of became our go-to cocktail, again, because it is so easy, it doesn't require a lot of ingredients, but is really satisfying. And then also is a great digestif or even an aperitif if you're going before or after a meal, you know, when we're cooking all of the food and then having to clean up after ourselves, it's always nice to have a drink in hand while you're doing it. So the ingredients yes, yeah. that, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's uh, very funny that um, we were lucky enough to spend Thanksgiving together or uh, an early Thanksgiving. And, um, you know, one of the 
most basic cocktails, one, 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 ingredients are all even, uh, somebody put it in a box. Somebody made a boxed Negroni. And, um, you know, I, I think the best part about the Negroni is you literally could take all three bottles, turn them upside down, and then you're done. Um, but we're going to play a little bit on that right now. And, um, you know, we talked about low ABV cocktails earlier, and this is not one. <laughs> so um, if I'm going to go ahead and jump in if you're all right with me going ahead yes, and getting go ahead and jump in. One. I'm going to spotlight you and then so that everyone can see you full on. All right. Okay. okay. And uh, I want you guys to know how fancy I am. I have my little red cooler over here with my ice. <laughs> so prepared. Um, I am so ready for this. Um, and in here I have my, we're going to get out a stirring glass and then we will need our, obviously our GH mom, wonderful, delicious champagne that we're going to have right here. Um, and then we're going to need um, Plymouth Gin is what we're going to be using today. And I am in the process of cleaning out so I can move. So I had just a little bit of the bottle left and it went in here. So I'm sorry that I don't have the full bottle to show y'all. I, um, I think I used this for the, the testing and the rest of it's going in today. So um, it, it's actually kind of humorous to see my liquor cabinet or my um, liquor collection right now because they're all in these smaller bottles <laughs> because I just didn't want to carry a whole bottle if I didn't have to whenever I moved. Um, so GH Mum Champagne, we're doing a uh, Plymouth Gin and then we have a sweet vermouth, so red vermouth, um, which always puts your vermouth in the fridge. Very yes, important. that's an excellent tip. Um, Thank you. <laughs> um, and you guys can grab your Campari. I'm actually going to be use, using Luxardo Aperitivo today. Um, so a basic Negroni is, as Ali said, one of the most simple cocktails you can find. Just a little bit more complicated than my champagne cocktail with the sugar cube emitters. Just a little. Um, so what we're going to do is we are going to pour equal parts of the gin, vermouth, and Campari. Campari. Mine is, again, a, an aperitivo. Um, and we're just going to do one, uh, one ounce of each. Um, so I'm going to pull out my lovely jigger right here. Um, and usually you can do one, one and a half. It depends on the size you're making. But um, since we're topping with, with champagne, we're just going to do one ounce. So let's go ahead and measure out one ounce of our gin. One ounce of our sweet vermouth. Again, keep it in the fridge if you can. And then one ounce of our aperitivo. I've never tried the aperitivo. How does it differ from traditional Campari? Because I have seen that it's an ingredient, you know, a lot of other bartenders have said, this mm -hmm. is the alternative to Campari. And that's one that gets mentioned quite a bit. But honestly, I, I just, um, I always have Campari in the house. And um, when I ran out this last time, I decided I just wanted to start trying through different ones. Um, and uh, I know Luxardo does a lot of other really fantastic um, cocktail modifiers and ingredients that I love. Everybody loves the Luxardo cherry, except for my mother. Love you, mom, but that's, you're wrong there. Um, but um, not only was the bottle actually really lovely, um, but I just wanted to try, start trying them out. This one is, I think, a little bit sweeter than Campari. Um, if you're not familiar with Campari, it is a, um, an Italian aperitif so it is something that they have before the meal so that they can prime their stomachs and get ready. Um, and then uh, really often it is somewhat bitter. Um, but again, like I said, this one's just a little bit sweeter than a traditional Campari. Um, so I think you guys probably have all caught up and we have our one, one part of those three ingredients each. And then we are going to stir this. So y'all don't judge my stirring style. I'm... <laughs> I'm never very good at this. I can get the job done. Um, so if you guys are stirring along with me at home, so the trick for this is you want to take the back of your bar spoon and put it against the inside of the glass. And then you want to try and keep it on the outside as well as you can. So we're not trying to agitate the ice so much as we're just stirring to chill and slightly combine. So once we're done with that... We are going to get our glass and we are going to, where did I put my glass? 
Oh, <laughs> it's right here. Um, so if I were making a traditional Negroni, I would probably make this in a different glass, make it a shorter rocks glass and um, pour it over ice. But since we are going to be adding champagne, I really wanted to make it in a little bit more exciting glass. So um, we're gonna strain this into our glass. And then once we have gotten that, we are going to top with GH Mum Champagne. And I didn't want to open these before I had you guys on because they just look so much nicer whenever they're not open. <laughs> and it's a really good way to show people how to open a bottle. It's always nice to come and come back to the basics. Yes. Um, so a little trivia for, for my champagne friend here. Um, do you want to tell everybody how many turns it takes to open a champagne cage? Oh, certainly. The number is six. <laughs> my dad tried to tell me the other day it was four and a half and I felt like that was incorrect so no it I'm is glad six. That, that is an automated thing that everyone in France now uses it's called a mucilage love that mucilage mucilage all right so um I am gonna do my best to not make a noise here but um as we have learned over the years it is actually better oh it's gonna make a sound it's actually better to not make a sound. I did. <laughs> that was very good. I, oh, darn. <laughs> I, was cert I was certain that I was going to lose track of that one right there. Um, but um, it's actually better, and Elise, you can talk about this a little bit more, but it's actually better for the champagne if you do not um, pop the top off and you don't run the risk of hitting someone in the eye. Exactly. Or having to file an, an insurance claim with your, you know, home insurance adjuster. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh my gosh, dealings. I'm making a mess today. Um, so here's our champagne cocktail. And I just realized that I don't have my Y peeler and I cannot easily get out of this setup I'm in right now. So um, if, if you guys have a knife or a Y peeler at home, go ahead and add a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a lemon twist here. And we have our first cocktail, um, the sparkling Negroni. Oh, so um, taste, cheers. <laughs> <laughs> cheers, everyone. So while we enjoy that first cocktail, I think that I'm going to send through the first poll so that we can ask everybody what sparkling cocktails that you've made maybe over the last year. And maybe if we're hoping that there's something new that you get today. So I'm going to allow the panelists to vote, but I know you might not be able to reach it. Plus, I know like what you had. So. <laughs> So while we do that, we can talk a little bit about why champagne is a great um, a great pairing for cocktails in general. But I also, and then we'll talk a little bit about Maison Moum as well. So when it comes to ingredients for cocktails, there are usually main components. You think you have a spirit, you normally have some kind of sugar, you normally have some kind of acid. So then all of those things come together to make a very beautiful, simple cocktail. Now, when you're thinking about the ingredients and elevating it from there, often when you use sparkling wine in a cocktail, they call it a royale. And when you have the royale, there, that's kind of, you're adding that component there. So when you add that component, champagne has acidity, it has sweetness, and it has bubbles. And so all of those things together um, make for one really beautiful, you know, one really beautifully composed cocktail. Now with the GH Mum, we're really looking at Pinot Noir here. So Maison Mum was actually founded back in 1827, and they have always been a brand that has gone beyond what the, you know, the limits of champagne or, you know, the social norm of what champagne is, you know, just for celebration, just for New Year's, only in flutes, you know, maybe has to be with super fancy food. And they kind of say like, no, we want to, and this is the hashtag that we use, champagne differently. And so we do that through innovation, we do that through our production methods, and we do that with our, what we call moments of consumption. And so with GH Mum, which this is the beautiful Grand Cordon bottle, which Susie was showing you earlier, you know, it all goes back to George Herman Mum, and that's where the GH comes from. 
Now we're looking at Pinot Noir, like I mentioned, and this is a brut champagne. So it's a little bit lower in terms of the overall residual sugar. It will add a little bit of that sugar component to your cocktail, but it's not going to be overpowering. Now, if you wanted something that was going to be a bit sweeter, you can do that. You know, we have demi sex, we have even an extra dry champagne is going to add a little bit of that extra sugar. And then you can dial back on using simple syrup or using fruit juices or whatever it is that you are building within your cocktail as a whole. But with this Negroni, as you saw, you know, we weren't using a, we actually weren't using a sweet thing. You know, even sweet vermouth isn't terribly sweet. It actually has a, light, a really nice depth to it. So by adding the champagne, you're adding a little bit more balance and then you're lifting the cocktail so that it doesn't seem as boozy, which is pretty cool. But that, that's what that carbonation does. You know, it kind of adds that lift. And because champagne, it, so the difference between something like Prosecco, which yeah, is really used a lot in spritz, and with champagne is the production method. And for those of you who have tuned in before, this is something you've heard us talk about. So the Charmat method, which is called the tank method, which is how they make Prosecco, it only goes through one fermentation and then the wine is actually carbonated under pressure. And so then they can just, you know, bottle it to order and then send it out. So it's always very fresh when you see it and the bubbles are very big and, you know, voluminous and, you know, really active. But with champagne, that second fermentation happens in the bottle. So the carbonation is actually integrated into the liquid. So when you use champagne in a cocktail, you're going to get more consistent bubbles over the course of time versus just one big burst. So if you, you, even if you just have champagne just in a glass, you see that the bubbles are consistent through, essentially throughout the entire course of your enjoyment. And so that will be the same once you use it as an ingredient. And yes, yeah, that is hashtag science. <laughs> it's a very good experiment. So I am going to share the results here of our poll before we move on. And it looks like a lot of people have just been doing champagne in the glass, which I totally you know support, whether it's a flute, a coupe, you want to use a white wine glass if you want to you know if you just want to put in a straw and drink it straight out of the bottle there's no judgments here i mean it's all about how you want to enjoy it but the french 75 is very popular spritzes as well no one actually chose a cure royale which i'm very surprised about but i think that might be a cocktail that is a little bit more you know a little a little bit more antiquated i guess at this point which is super interesting i mean how many people have creme de cassis in their bar right now you i mean of course you do <laughs> Um, I, I do because it is a family tradition to, well, we haven't done it in a while, I guess, I, but for my parents and my sister that are probably watching right now, I challenge us to have a Cure Royale night um, uh, in Orlando when we all meet up there in a couple, or in a month. Um, but uh, we actually had an entire party around a Cure Royale uh, years ago because we just decided we needed a night to, you know, try something fun and new, and that was going to be our easy champagne cocktail for the night. So that's what we chose. And I love a Cure Royale. I, I love them, quite honestly. They're delicious. <laughs> I actually had a Cure. So when I went, my previous job, I was working for a company called Esprit de Vin, and we had some wonderful producers in Burgundy. So I had a chance to go to Burgundy with the company, and it was incredible. And at one of the houses that we visited, they poured us a cure before um, our actual meal came out. And so that is the creme de cassis with white wine. Typically in Burgundy, it's gonna be Chardonnay, but you can use other grapes as well. And so I had never known that that was actually the origin of a cure royale, hence the idea of adding bubbles that makes it royalty because of course champagne has always been known in France as the wine of kings, going all, all the way back to the coronation of King Clovis, which is very long ago, <laughs> so super interesting. The other one that no one actually chose, and I'm wondering, I'm, I know that you know what this is because you lived in France, um, but a piscine. I'm wondering if people maybe don't know what a piscine is. Have you heard of it called that? I have actually yeah, not heard of it. It's actually just champagne on ice. So piscine in French means pool. And so this is something, and if, if you've seen some of those kind of higher, you know, higher dosage champagnes out there, a lot of them are like the brand Ice or, you know, the brand Riche, um, those kind of styles that are meant for, you know, warmer climates, meant to be poured on ice, that is what a piscine is. So we're learning things today. <laughs> 
Excellent. So I'm curious, now that we've made the first cocktail, um, I'm super curious how you figure out how to kind of play with ingredients. You know, when you were thinking about adding sham, you know, like, because I asked you to prepare these because I knew that you would have really great answers and really great cocktails to be able to share. You know, this, a lot of classic cocktails with a twist, which is what this was, you know, what are some other ways to experiment with cocktails like this in order to, you know, kind of like elevate your champagne game? So I think um, for, for me, I did a lot of research before this. I wanted to have a, a, a little bit, a, a stirred one and a shaken one. Um, rule of thumb, whenever you guys are working with any champagne and cocktails, do not put the champagne in a shaker. That's going to ruin your night. <laughs> yes. Um, Another insider tip. <laughs> and, and I can't say I haven't done it. I did it whenever I was very young one time and I will never do it again. Um, but there, there's so, the, with the bubbles already in it and the carbonation, you cannot shake it because it will go everywhere. Um, so just thinking of that, um, obviously, um, as Elise said, it brings in a lot of elements that make us not need other things as much. Um, so with this cocktail, it is uh, obviously building on a classic, but um, GHM actually, it, it has beautiful flavor on its own, but it actually plays so well with other cocktails that, um, you know, I, I tried out one that I really didn't like for today, um, but then I tried out a few others and really liked all three of them. Um, sometimes it's just replacing a club soda with a sparkling wine, champagne, obviously, in this case. Um, but sometimes with like this Negroni, it's just adding a little bit of bumped up element to it. Um, so as much as I'd love to say I tried 18 different ones and these were the best two, champagne actually pairs so nicely with things that oftentimes you're going to be able to add champagne to something just to kind of bump it up a little bit, bump up the fun. And as, as you said before, make it a Royale. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I would say definitely start playing around with it. Have fun with it. As, as Elise said before, champagne differently. Try it in cocktails. Try it. Um, I mean, heck, you. I remember one time I had, whenever I was very young, <laughs> I was handed a cocktail and they said, oh, it's tequila and champagne. And I was like, oh my God, what is this going to be like? And it ended up being absolutely delightful. Um, because it really, like, it plays so well with other things. It can um, amp up certain things in a cocktail, but then also um, let the other ingredients still sing. And it's not as boring at all as a club soda. And, um, you know, I with these, I have to say, that I, I love a classic with a little bit of extra. Um, I made the other day, I made a sidecar that had um, a little bit of champagne on top of it. And that actually was really nice too. I might have to be dipping into one of those again tonight. Um, Cause you know, whenever you say something is just in your mind, I'm going to have to have, <laughs> have one tonight. Um, but, but I would say the best way to test things out is to just play with it, have fun with it. Open a bottle because darn, at the end of the night, whenever you have a little bit left, you still have to drink the champagne. Oh my gosh, too bad. Um, <laughs> so um, I think my AirPods turned off. So if you guys would give me half a second, I'm going to make sure I can hear you all very well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. I think we're good now. Sorry about okay. that. You guys have to see me up close there for a second. No, of course. We love <laughs> but, that beautiful um, face. <laughs> But as I said before, you just have to challenge yourself to try new things because you can have the same cocktail all day, every day, but sometimes by just, you know, dialing it up with having a little bit of champagne in it, that's going to, you know, you'll have the next decade to enjoy that same cocktail in a very different way. <laughs> that's true. And for me, sometimes the drinks that I'm enjoying kind of transport me somewhere, especially if it's something that maybe you've had somewhere else. And then when you have it again, especially if you're at home, it kind of is a way to go down memory lane. And, you know, I'm wondering for you, I mean, obviously we were doing spring friendly cocktails and the next one that we're going to do has, has a fruit component. So I think that that's super appropriate. But, you know, you're talking about classic cocktails and, you know, Obviously, we could wax poetic about this, and I know that you've had some amazing experiences. I'd be curious what some of your favorite cities for experiencing cocktail culture are. Um, I do love Paris for many reasons, um, mostly because you go to Paris expecting it to just be wine, champagne, and I mean, nothing wrong with the champagne. I love it. 
but I mean, you go, you go to Paris having that in your mind and you can find some of the most absolutely just extraordinary um, cocktail, um, sorry, cocktail bars there. Um, and I've really actually, um, I did my study abroad there and I ended up discovering a lot of spirits that I never would have tried otherwise. Um, went into one of our, our pubs that we used to go into a lot and it was a, well, I guess it was a, a cavern. Um, one night and we just were asking questions. Well, what's this? What's this? What's this? What's this? And this is whenever I was 19. So, um, the bartender was kind enough to, in French, bring things down, tell us all about them. And, you know, that's the first time I had a lot of different spirits and a lot of different, um, modifiers. And I feel like that night was a real turning point for me because it gave me a new appreciation for the cocktail and for the ingredients that are put in them. It wasn't just a gin and tonic anymore. It was a Spanish gin with a Mediterranean tonic and it had juniper berries because that brings out this and that and the other. And um, I, I think Paris is for that reason stuck out in my head always as a place that I've always learned a lot. Um, so many U.S. cities have had an impact on my appreciation of cocktails. I'd say San Diego really has. It sounds like an odd place to place to put a finger on, but uh, they have somewhere called, um, and I'm going to blank right now. Um, can't it's think of the name right now. It's the Tiki Bar. Love that. Uh, tiki Bar is always great, but um, I am, I'm losing my mind tonight, but um, they have, you know, it, it was kind of the same experience, but it was, you know, 10 years later, whenever I knew so much more and I was able to ask more, um, more intense questions about, but why, but why did you use this and this? And why did you use this and this? So, um, you know, 10 years later, I had the same type of experience, but it was just on a whole different level. Um, but really, I think, um, you know, Paris, like I said, has always held that, held that really wonderful spot in my mind. And, um, I actually got the memory on Facebook yesterday that, um, I guess it was 14 years ago. 15, I don't know. A lot of years ago, my sister and I were actually in the Champagne region of France and touring different facilities. And uh, that was an experience. <laughs> Maybe one day I'll get to tell you that story, Lisa. <laughs> we'll do it over a bottle of champagne just to make sure. And if Alice can be there too, then that would be really nice. <laughs> then we won't be able to have the champagne. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Well, it seems like a lot of your the great experiences that you've had within these cocktail, you know, forward cities have been really augmented by the kind of guidance of someone behind the bar. And I think that we learn so much more when we're able to do it with a person who is so passionate about what they do. I mean, taking the time to actually pull bottles down and, you know, talk to someone about it and to really kind of enlighten someone's cocktail experience. So like you said, it's not just a gin and tonic or it's not just a vodka soda or, you know, whatever it is that they're ordering. It kind of makes you more comfortable in the bar setting. And I'm wondering if you have any specific bar heroes or even sheroes, as we like to say nowadays, um, who have really kind of inspired you throughout your journey, whether it was personally or even from afar. I certainly do. And of course, I'm I, I told you my mind is mush today, so I'm, I'm embarrassed I'm not going to be able to remember names. Um, but uh, the owner of Dear Irving um, up in New York, I got to judge a cocktail competition with her a couple years ago at San Antonio Cocktail Conference. Um, and just the way that she thought about the spirit, thought about the cocktails that we were tasting and um, not just looked at the cocktail itself, but why the cocktail was made, um, that, that kind of changed something in my mind a little bit that night. And, um, I mean, she was an absolute delight also. Um, and then, um, and like I said, I'm, I'm absolutely losing my mind today. Polite Provisions was the one in San Diego and it's actually the owner of Polite Provisions and I can't think of his name and I don't know what is going on with me today, but, um, he's the one that does the, um, well, I'm just at a loss for everything today. I don't know why I can't think of words, um, but I'll, <laughs> I'll send you a message. 
we can always we can what put it day. back on the website when we send everything. When I put it on YouTube, I can put it in um, the actual comments down there. You know, there because there's so it. many. I mean, you know, the owner of Llama and Llama Son in New York, you know, she started Speed Rack, and you know, there are just there's so many inspiring people out there. And like one of the owners of um, Amoria Margo, which I took my parents to when we were in New York together. I mean, gosh, I mean, now we're going on almost, you know, going on a year and a half. And, you know, those experiences where someone really does want to take the time and not just with you, but, you know, really want to push the whole culture of cocktail forward in a very positive way, in an educational way. Because at the end of the day, I mean, we talk about wine as an art form. Cocktails are also an art form. You're taking raw ingredients and making them into something cohesive and, you know, something that someone gets to enjoy. And I think that that is a skill that should certainly be celebrated. Uh, um, um, something you just said in there is, um, you know, I, I am so impressed and in awe with the women who are helping, um, helping further other women. I mean, I just, I think that is one of the most inspiring things locally. Um, there's a girl named Rosie um, that has been every year, except for this past one, which understandable, um, has been just basically looking to see how she can not only help women in the industry, but especially now that everything's been happening, she started another charity. Um, so Rosie has been an incredible influence on me from not just shaking drinks behind the bar and making them delicious, but the way that she's raising other people up so much. I did look it up. It's Eric Castro. I am losing my mind today. Um, and then another local kind of bartender hero of mine is George Kaiho um, over at Jettison. I know you're a fan of Jettison. Um, he just does the most interesting things and being able to see some of the, the crazy things that he puts in a cocktail, um, just it's, it's absolutely mind blowing. And he does it all and just has like a little joke and a little like drink flip ready to go for you. And um, if you guys are um, ever in Dallas, find Jettison. He does an incredible job. Absolutely amazing. I definitely agree. Now, taking inspiration from some of these people in terms of your own process, you know, what, how do you develop recipes? And, you know, when there, because there are brands that, you know, will send you spirits, especially things that are new so that you can kind of play around with them, see what the flavor profile is like, and then be able to post about it so that your consumer base, I think you're almost up to 19,000 followers now, can, you know, glean a little bit of information from you and your expertise. So can you kind of take us through like what that process looks like? Yes. Uh, first, I do obviously a tasting of the spirit on its own, um, just to, as you said, really appreciate it for what it is and what it isn't. Um, obviously, every, every gin's different, every wine's different, every champagne's different, every, every aperitivo is going to be different. Um, so making sure that I know the nuances of what I am bringing in. Um, and starting to make a cocktail with, um, that's always the most important thing. I taste it on its own. I taste it after it's been open a few minutes. I taste it on the rocks just to make sure I understand how the spirit is going to open up in a cocktail. Um, and then I try and pick out things that uh, would pair nicely with the flavors in that. So let's say we have a whiskey that has um, strong leather, oak, and tobacco notes. Then I'm probably going to pinpoint that tobacco and say, okay, what else goes nicely with tobacco? And then try and back up and pair things that way. Um, but I, I do think it's, you know, with, with some ex exceptions, one vodka is not going to be the same as another. One gin is not going to be the same as another. So yes, while it's nice to say, okay, I just want a Negroni with gin, you need to know what kind of gin you like in your Negroni. Um, and, and I think that's, uh, you know, and, and it's, I might have simplified that sounding or sounded like I simplified that earlier, like just add champagne to it. Doesn't always work, but it does often. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I think the beauty of getting to try new things and put them into uh, recipes that I'm coming up with, um, I always will start with, I mean, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. I look at classics and I say, how can I bring this in and how can I modify this? How can I amp it up a little bit? How can I make it a little bit more exciting? Or how can I take out something I don't like? Um, so I usually do start with an idea of a classic because as you said, it yes, while cocktail making isn't 
an exact science. It definitely has been proven that certain recipes are great. <laughs> and I'm never going to go and question, you know, Dale DeGroff after him making his classic cocktails. You know, but I can take a classic cocktail and build on it and change it a little bit. Um, so my process is usually, as I said, trying the spirit and then finding a classic cocktail that I think could work with it and then building on that specific classic. And I think I've seen a book on your coffee table, the Flavor Bible. I think that that's always a nice resource oh, yeah. to have. Um, and it kind of talks about flavor combinations, not just for drinks, but also with food in general. And it brings in some really cool elements. And yeah, so I'm wondering as well, you know, you've kind of alluded to this a little bit, but what combinations have you tried before that didn't quite work? Because you even mentioned earlier that there was a cocktail that you tried to make that you're just like, uh, I don't think so. And what are some of those things that maybe just kind of haven't gone together? Oh, golly. Um, obviously, there have been so many. And I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned the Flavor Bible. If you guys don't have a Flavor Bible, go buy a Flavor Bible. <laughs> um, this thing is the most extraordinary book. Um, so let's say I, I'm going to go back to my example of the gin. I get a gin in that is very juniper forward. I am able to then go to the book and look up juniper and then see what they suggest actually would go well with that. Um, so it, it's kind of like a color wheel. Um, you, you get one flavor and then you look at what complements it, what's next to it. Um, but uh, yes, everyone go buy the book. Um, <laughs> I love that analogy of the color wheel. If you need a link text me, I'll get you, I'll get you taken care of. Um, but, you know, I, I think that looking at flavors that are going to go together, you know, obviously we're always going to find some weird ones that shouldn't go together, but seem to. Um, and I wish I could remember, um, I had lingam, oh, I had lingonberry syrup. Um, actually from Ikea, I read years ago that it actually was great for cocktails. And so I bought a bottle of it years ago. Um, and ended up getting it out for the spritzes that I made <laughs> during the storm. Um, but just, I, I tried a few things with that and I was like, oh, well, what if we smoked it? And like my mom and I like tried some things and smoked a glass and put the lingonberry syrup in and it did not work. Um, but, you know, never, never be discouraged if, if a flavor combination that you think is going to be extraordinary just doesn't work. Toss it, make another. Yeah, let's start over. <laughs> That's the beauty of it. I love that. There you go. So obviously we're doing a cocktail class right now. And over the course of the last year, you know, even, yeah, I mean, we're kind of a little bit over a year anniversary now of the pandemic as a whole, you know, this has become a very popular forum for people to be able to still connect. And, you know, for you, how many of these online spirits and cocktail classes have you attended? Do you even have a number? Oh, gosh. Um... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I, I'd say like we're, we're in the 20s, at least. Um, I mean, I've, I've led seven or eight. Um, probably more than that, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. Um, but I, I've probably attended somewhere in the 20s. And um, I think the most hilarious one that happened to me, um, I was able to, I was asked by a brand to invite four of my um, other blogger friends and we hopped on and they had sent us everything for cocktails and for dinner and they had um, a bartender there and they had a chef there and they were telling us how to make everything and they were walking us through stuff and we were supposed to be heating up our Dutch ovens for, um, for uh, the chicken and I had mine on way hot and I was like sitting over there making a drink and all of a sudden, I'm like, that something smells terrible in here. So continue to make my drink, make my drink, whatever, and then walk over to the, and I will never forget, I had my drink in my hand and I put a, put an oven mitt on and I go to, <laughs> I go to open the Dutch oven, just put the drink down, get the chicken, I'm, re I'm ready to go. And there is a literal airplane bottle of liquor in my, in my Dutch oven. And unfortunately it was in a plastic, oh, no. <laughs> in a plastic one. My poor Dutch oven has never been the same since. Oh. Um, <laughs> you can't make this stuff up, man. Yeah. But that's just, <laughs> but why, uh, why was there 
a, an airplane bottle in my Dutch oven. I mean, it's me. I don't really know, but it's me. So that I'm not, I'm not too floored by it. But um, yeah, I've had some interesting experiences on those Zoom calls for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Well, how do you prepare when you're going to be a host? I mean, it's one thing to be a viewer, you know, like where you can kind of let someone else take the lead, but what is it like being a host and how do you prepare yourself for that? Especially because I know the last one that you did had about 600 people. Oh yeah, that was terrifying. Um, I was lucky enough to work with Chief Caribbean to do a cocktail class for National Margarita Day. And um, quite honestly, it worked out so oddly. They asked me to do it. And I said, well, I'm, I'm actually going to be in Mexico um, during that time. And so they worked with the resort and like the resort put everything I needed in a bar. And basically I just set it up and framed it up. And um, that was a really fun night. Um, really fun night. And it doesn't matter how early I start getting ready for those. We got there an hour early and right before we're still like, hi. <laughs> so it doesn't matter how early you start getting ready for those it seems like there's always like oh I forgot the ice or I forgot this and you have to run and get it and um you know I think what I need to remember every time now is set the camera set the camera an hour before yes <laughs> set, the, set the camera an hour before then go get everything ready uh, you know, even, even today I was a little bit behind. And so I'm sorry, you guys got my, my little updo here. Um, but yes, I, I, I think that probably was the funniest one that, um, you know, I, I walked in and everything was ready and I still somehow wasn't ready until 30 seconds before. <laughs> so, um, I think definitely setting the camera an hour before and then going to try to do everything else is the way to do it. That's definitely seems smart to me now. And I mean, you doing this virtually, I mean, we're all still learning, you know, so those little tips like that still make a difference. And, you know, with every Just Add Champagne episode that I do, I tweak something here or there just to make it a better consumer experience. Because of course, if I can't be there with you, how do I still bring the same energy that I would in an in-person event? And so I'm curious for your perspective, you know, you're a world traveler, you know, you've gotten to go to events all over the world. I mean, not even just within the United States. I mean, you and I have gone to the San Antonio cocktail conference before we talked about tales of the cocktail in New Orleans. What has been the biggest difference for you with these online curated events that brands have been doing versus the ones that you got to, you know, experience in person? That's a great question. Um, I think obviously it's not going to be the, the same experience um, because, I mean, if, if we were all here in person, I would have given everyone a hug on the way in and <laughs> um, we'd be, you know, sitting here, you know, uh, you know, I'm telling you words just, they don't work today. Elbowing each other. That's an elbow. Um, but I, I do think um, seeing how so many companies have pivoted to respond to this and to still be there for their consumers and be there for their fans. It's been really incredible. And, you know, I've, I've had to do a little bit of that too at the beginning. Uh, whenever we couldn't leave, we were all home. Um, you know, I did a, a couple things where I said, tell me what's in your pantry and we'll make something. And, um, you know, those might have just been me and one other person. But, um, you know, fi finding ways to be creative with that has been really extraordinary. Um, and I, I think the biggest difference between going to an event, yes, some of the events that I went to last year, in years past, were so creative and so well thought out and so well prepared for, but then they didn't take any like immediate creativity, if that makes sense. So what we're doing, you have to turn some things around in a day and make it look as extraordinary as if, you know, <laughs> we had, you know, two years to prepare for something. Um, so I, I think um, the, the biggest difference I've seen with all of this is just that need for the, the essential, the essential, the need for the immediate creativity um, and then getting to see how well people are thinking on their feet like that. So that I think has been really extraordinary to see some of those differences. 
Well, and related to that, we actually have a question from the audience. So Hannah wanted to know, you know, your your visual aesthetic, you know, seems, you know, just as chill and refined as you are. I know Hannah knows you in person, so she definitely <laughs> has a good reference here. And so she said, you know, like that aesthetic is just as refined as your custom cocktails. So she wanted to know, do you go through the, you know, just as many variations to determine your social presence as you do for a new recipe? That's a great question right now. Um, and uh, I, I am in the midst of a rebrand. Um, so the, the idea that, yes, I have worked so hard to curate my social brand and every picture I put up, you know, I, I test it and I look at it and then, you know, perfect example, I, I worked so hard on this shoot I did that I put up yesterday morning and it bombed. And, you know, as so many of us, um, so many of us try so hard to curate perfection. And, you know, I, I sent it off to a friend and I said, why did this bomb? Like, it's so, like, the pictures are great. It's whiskey. People love whiskey. Why? And she's like, it's not you. And, you know, that's, that's something that I'm having to learn and kind of curate everything in a very different way now. Um, but overall, I think, you know, having a look that I go for and, um, obviously I have a certain style of photography that I do. Um, and then I have my presets that I use that try and make everything look cohesive. Um, it does take a lot. It's not just me running outside and taking a picture of a drink in my hand anymore. Um, and it was whenever I first started. Um, but it takes, it takes a lot, it takes a lot of work actually. <laughs> full-time job and you know there's a lot that goes into it and the hardest part I think especially for someone who is you know their own boss and has their own company like you is how do you say no how do you say no to business you know because it's like you want to be able to you know be that go-to person and you want to be able to expand your network and you know but like you said you're going through a rebrand and so once you do that hopefully you'll have you'll know like when an opportunity fits the brand and if it doesn't you have to politely decline and maybe even, you know, refer them to one of your other blogger friends who might have an aesthetic that better fits you know, that storyline. But it's a really difficult thing to do. We're going through the same thing right now with both of our um, champagne brands. We're thinking about what our timeless story is. And you want to be able to, you know, you want to reach every single consumer and you want to definitely go after that business because, of course, you know, that's how we generate sales. But that is not the best strategy to create lasting relationships with your consumer or with your guest when you're in the on-premise. And so you have to know who your target really is and really channel it down that road and find your brand lover. And so that's what we're definitely trying to do right now. And it's absolutely incredible to get to go through those case studies and really learn it from the inside out. I didn't study marketing, so it's all very new to me every day, but it's absolutely fascinating. And then of course, I'll get to go out and like be the face of that new timeless story once we figure out what it is. <laughs> well, I see that, I mean, the fact that we've been doing so many of these and the fact that there is so much thought that goes into them, like you said, and you have to be more creative, do you think that this is a trend that's going to continue, you know, down the line once we, you know, figure out some semblance of what the new normal is? You know, like here in Texas, we're essentially open for business. And so, like, do you think that people are going to continue to utilize the virtual for their education and entertainment opportunities? I hope so. <laughs> um, obviously, our, our business has changed a lot. Um, what you do has changed extraordinarily. What I do has changed a lot. Um, and I, I really actually do hope that some element stays online because if you think about it right now, people can be watching us from anywhere in the world. But if we do an on-site event, we are very limited to the people that can attend that night in that city. Um, so I think it gives us an opportunity to really reach out to more people and reach more people. Um, and I, I do hope that we actually keep it up. I hope that there is some lasting element of this that does carry on. I agree. And to cheers to that, I think that we should do the second cocktail of the yes. night, the Coco Cordon, ma'am. And so I'm going to put the recipe in the chat right now while we start talking through it. This is a super so fun I'm glad one. you said it that way because I, in my mind, I was like, oh, the Coco Cordon, mom. <laughs> and... <laughs> 
And I showed I showed the recipe to somebody the other day, and they were like, "Coco Coco Cordon, ma'am," and I was like, "Oh." oh <laughs> so nice. I I was trying I was trying to go for the mom, mom, mm -hmm. madame, um, madame. <laughs> So um, I, I might have missed the mark on that one, but... <laughs> well, when we're also in Texas, so, like, that's definitely the colloquialism here. <laughs> there you go. So um, I'm going to go ahead and walk you guys through this one. Um, it has quite a few more ingredients um, than our very simple Negroni, sparkling Negroni. Um, and as I said, you are going to put your champagne in last, but we're going to go ahead and get it prepped so that we can pour it in. So we are going to turn our six turns as we did with the previous one. All right, Elise, do you think I can do it again? I'm fully confident in you. Well, I uh, am a little sad that we're not uh, sabering any of these today, but I know every you have become <laughs> my sabering champion. Um, for those of you who didn't know, so GH Mom sabering is a big part of what we like to call our brand ethos. And it's kind of that ultimate celebratory moment when you take a sword or any sort of object that has a blunt edge. And then you, when the bottle is super cold, you run it along the edge. And when you hit that second lip, the pressure inside the bottle will actually push the rest of the, uh, that lip off with the cork with it. And this is something that I used to do a lot for events. Um, when I met Susie at Tails, I probably taught 75 people over the course of one activation. And then of course, you know, Susie was like, oh, oh, oh me, me, me. And I said, yes, of course, let's do this. And every time, you know, she travels somewhere, I feel like she is teaching people how <laughs> and is sabering a bottle and gets amazing photos with it. So I have to say thank you to you for being, I mean, you already technically knew how to do it, but I feel like, you know, now I get to say that, you know, you're my sabering friend and champion. Well, you are my guru for sure. Um, okay, so um, we're gonna go ahead and start with our vodka. Um, we're not gonna do this today because we know what we're making, but if you're, Here's, here's a little pro tip from Susie here, who's messed up quite a few cocktails in my day. Um, if you are making a cocktail at home and you're not exactly sure that you have all the steps down right, liquor lasts. Liquor is the most expensive part. So if you accidentally mess something up, then you haven't messed up your liquor, which again is the most expensive part of a cocktail. So um, today we're actually going to start with the liquor but that's because I know what we're making and it's fine. <laughs> um, so Absolute Elix, we're going to start with 1.25 ounces of that. Dump it in our shaker. And again, remember, we're putting in the champagne last. I'll say that eight times. Um, <laughs> so we've got uh, 1.25 ounces of Absolute Elix vodka. We're going to do 0.75 ounces of simple syrup, which is so easy to make. It's called simple syrup for a reason. I personally, because I don't like to keep it too long um, because it will actually mold and you do have to keep it in the fridge. I will just heat up a mug of hot water or heat up a mug of water until it's boiling. And then I stir in one to one sugar to water. It's just about as easy as you can get. Um, so we're gonna do 0.75 ounces of that. Uh, nice. And then we are going to do a quarter ounce of lemon. And did I forget my, I did. Look at that. All right. Well, we're just going to put our sweet. lemon <laughs> in here. Um, so again, we're doing a quarter of an ounce. So you don't need a ton. Um, just to brighten it up. That's ice. Oh. Oh my goodness, it's right here. <laughs> not only can I not think of words, but I'm misplacing things that I've, yeah. All right, so, all right, we have our lemon juice in there. Um, and then we are going to do two bar spoons of coconut cream, which gives this like almost a little bit of a tiki vibe, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and you keep your coconut cream in the fridge, so I only brought a little bit here. 
Let's see if we can get out of this teeny tiny little thing. Well, can you tell everyone <laughs> how you buy coconut cream? Because I know when you go to a liquor store or a package shop, they often have, you know, bottled coconut cream. But I, you know, where, what, how do you do yours? Is that what you buy or do you get it from a different source? Um, so I'm, I'm actually, I, I don't go through a ton at home because um, I actually do not drink at home often. Um, I rarely drink at home, actually. I was talking to a friend about this yesterday. Um, I rarely drink at home. And so I don't like to keep um, too much, fr too many fresh ingredients in the house, too many ingredients that you have to um, keep in the fridge, anything like that. Um, mostly because I know I'm not going to go through it too fast. Um, so I actually just have the Coco Lopez and it, it's fine to use that. Um, I do know a local restaurant that makes their own coconut cream and it is delicious. Who is um, that? Please tell. <laughs> Hero. Oh. <laughs> yep. They, they made, um, they were doing a Miami Vice for a little while and the um, coconut cream they used in their pina colada they made in-house and it was extraordinary. Nice. Um, yeah, it was, it was very good. Um, all right. So we have our... Um, we have our vodka, our lemon juice, our simple syrup, and our two bar spoons of coconut cream in there. So again, back to my trusty cooler over here. We're going to get some ice and shake this up. And this might get a little loud, so I'm sorry, everyone. It's all part of the show. And for those of you who maybe have not heard of Coco Lopez, or if you often keep cans of coconut milk at your house, you can actually use that as well. So when the can is just in your pantry, oftentimes it will start to separate. So when it does that, um, the cream rises to the top. So when you open the can, you can actually scoop the cream out. There are a lot of recipes, um, especially if you have some kind of like vegetarian or vegan diet that will use that in place of other fats. So that's another way that you can use coconut cream. Ah, uh, oh, I thought I had it that time. <laughs> That's always the part that I struggle with the most as well. It's like, the seal is so good. I can't pop it. <laughs> All right. Well, we might be in trouble. Oh, there we go. I just uh, pushed it down a little too far. Um, you guys at home are probably using cobbler shakers that are a little bit easier to um, negotiate. But, um, you know, I just love the look of these Boston shakers. Um, and that's what you have whenever it's too... Um, two cans like this, as opposed to um, one can with a top that has the strainer built in. Um, so we are going to over fresh ice, mind you. Again, I've got this, this great little ice bucket over here. <laughs> um, and we're going to over fresh ice, we're gonna strain this into a big glass. And as I said, you don't want there to be too much ice in here because you do want the liquid to just cover the ice because it's going to mess up our co or our our, um, our coconut cream look if we um, have too much in here. Mm -hmm. um, so we strain that in. I forgot the raspberries. I knew I just, it was. Coming, I was just going right? to say, I'm like, oh, it's not as pink as in the photo. I wow. Know okay, happens. guys, <laughs> y'all, I don't know what is going on today. But like I said, if you mess something up, it doesn't matter. Just make it again. <laughs> well, and this is the thing. Like, I mean, real life does not always go according to script. And so now you know that this all happens live. This is not something, you know, that we rehearse over and over and over again. We want you guys to have the real experience. So that's what's happening right now. <laughs> yes, this is the real experience. So um, five raspberries, that's where we start. We start muddling with five raspberries and you're going to put those in the bottom of your shaker. You take your muddler. If you have a bar spoon that has the muddler built in, that's the way to go. We're going to crush these a little bit. Oh my gosh, guys. I and don't know what's happening today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now we have our five raspberries muddled in the bottom. We have our vodka coconut cream, lemon, and simple syrup. And we're going to go ahead and give that another little shake. Woo! All right. <laughs> okay. All right. So try all this again. <laughs> I have never worked as a bartender, if anybody was wondering. <laughs> you just play one on TV? <laughs> I do, yes. Uh, there we go. There we go. That's that, that gorgeous that. color I wanted to see. <laughs> yes. And now I'm going to get fresh ice out because I shook that other ice in here. 
I just think this is so fun because the color is so pastel mm -hmm. um, because of that coconut cream. And I just think it looks so neat. It's perfect um, for spring and perfect for Easter coming up. If you want to serve yes. cocktails at your Easter party, this would definitely be a good one. <laughs> yes. Um, and really, you could probably use a different um, fruit other than raspberries if you guys were so inclined. So um, you could even, if you wanted to go crazy, you could have different flavors of berries and people could pick the flavor of berries and you could muddle them custom for each person if you were feeling a little wild. Um, so we're gonna take this one and then we are going to, if you feel so inclined and you have extra coconut cream in there, um, you can just take this and pour the champagne over a bar spoon so that it doesn't mess up your coconut cream. I didn't have too much in there. I didn't wanna overwhelm um, didn't want to overwhelm the glass, but here we have our Coco Four Dawn Mom. Oh, and, that is gorgeous. And we are going to, as we're meant to, um, uh, <laughs> imagine me. <laughs> imagine you and me and me and you. Imagine me gracious for the people on the show. Oh my gosh, I even... <laughs> I even made a joke to Elise before we started that it's hard to get in and out of where I am. <laughs> and I was like, but don't worry, I think I have everything. <laughs> so um, if you have your nutmeg at home, <laughs> now I'm just thinking it's going to like jump out at me the second that we're done. Oh, your grater? Um, yeah. You know what? You you talk to the people. I'm going of to get course. the grater. Well, while you find your grater, I can talk to everyone about why the Grand Cordon Rosé is the perfect uh, wine for this. So when we think about rosé, normally we think it has a lot of sweetness, but that's actually not true. It all depends on the actual style of the house. So with GH Mum, our house grape, of course, like I mentioned, is Pinot Noir. So we use 60% Pinot Noir in this particular blend. So that really kicks up a lot of the bold character of the wine. And it also adds a lot of depth in terms of big red fruit, but we dialed down the dosage. So with the fruit, we were looking at eight grams per liter, if you want to get technical. With the rosé, we dial it down to six because we really want those really bright fruit flavors to come through instead of, you know, be kind of becoming a little bit softer of a champagne overall. So you're getting acidity you're getting a little bit of that fruit forward characteristic and you're get, again getting those bubbles. So you're gonna have a lot more intensity within this wine versus just a brute style champagne. And so if you think about the different elements of this cocktail, if you think about the coconut cream, that's gonna have a lot of richness. The vodka, actually Absolute Elix is really cool because it's distilled in a copper spill and they also use sacrificial copper distillation. Um, so they're actually throwing packs of copper into the, the distillate in order to pull out even more impurities. So it has this wonderful viscosity. So then that adds a little bit of that. Then you think about the acidity coming from the lemon juice and also from the raspberries because those are a very tart fruit. And I'm glad that we're using raspberries for this because often I think you get raspberry and cranberry coming out of this particular wine. So I think that those things go together really beautifully. And then adding the nutmeg on top, which she just did, is really just kind of the, the piece de resistance. You know, it's the candles on top of the cake because it adds a really cool aromatic quality and kind of brings all of those elements together and is something that is very popular, especially within tiki culture. So I'm glad that she brought this out. Well, so it and it makes it look really cool. Obviously, with your <laughs> microplane, I mean, come on. <laughs> So um, I, th I think adding nutmeg on a cocktail, as, as Elise said, it really brings out a lot of um, aromatic notes to it because it's the first thing that's going hit to hit you whenever you pick this up. Um, but all you need is just a very simple microplane and nutmeg actually, um, it, it um, grates really easily. Um, you'd be very surprised. So um, like you could see this one. Snow. You know, like <laughs> chocolate. Snow. This one's well loved. Um, but then just throw our raspberries on top, and then we have our Coco Cordon Mom. Cheers! I love that. That is a beautiful cocktail, Susie. And Victoria said she envisions this cocktail with some cute peeps for an adorable tablescape for Easter. So I am definitely all about that. And maybe I'll do that because my family and I were all getting together for Easter um, in South Carolina. It's actually going to be my 10th wedding anniversary and also the first birthday of my nephew, Rowan, who I love so much. And so maybe we'll have to make these and have a tablescape of peeps <laughs> go along with our Easter baskets, which I think would be really beautiful. 
Now, when absolutely you, adorable. Oh, yeah. When you take your first sip, what are your, like, where does this cocktail transport you to? Um, actually this one, it, it, it actually seems right for Charleston now that you say that. Um, <laughs> But um, I'd say this is this is a very light cocktail because we only used two bar, bar spoons of that um, coconut cream, so it didn't it didn't drag it down too much. It's just like um, an emulsifier, right? And and I did in my picture the other day. You can tell it's a little creamier in the picture. I used extra in the picture the other day because I did want it to look a little creamier. Um, but I mean the the. The elements of this play so nicely together, um, and and really, I'd say this this like takes me to Florida. I won't say all the way down to Miami or Key West, um, but like I, I'm thinking maybe like Sanibel Island, <laughs> just something refreshing, light, fun, and I, I think the champagne on top of this is actually just so delightful. So um, I'm probably while I don't drink at home, I'll probably be finishing this one tonight. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I'm definitely going to be making these as well after, of course, like as the moderator, I want to be able to focus on you. Um, and so I'm really excited now to have these recipes so that I can make them at home. I've got my bottles chilling in the fridge right now so that I can definitely go down that road. So we've reached the end of the program, and I think that we've covered a lot of ground. We've had some excellent insider tips from you, Susie, and I have to say, like, I'm so looking forward to spring and so looking forward to, quote unquote, spritz season because I think that it's going to be a lot of fun. I think that we've so thus far we've answered everyone's questions which is absolutely excellent but I wanted to put in a couple of extra things here so that everyone can follow us on our socials here. If you're not following Susie yet you need to. Her content is super fun um, especially when she gets to gallivant around the world. I think that you will be relocating soon so I'm looking forward to seeing where some of that content goes so I will be watching. Yes, if you guys are uh, fans of Hawaii, I am taken off for about a month, <laughs> and I'm going to go just, as, as Elise said, I'm going to gallivant around Hawaii because um, I can. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's <laughs> the best reason. <laughs> that's nothing to apologize for there. <laughs> yes, we'll be having plenty of tiki cocktails and um, trying to discover some other fun things that they're doing in Maui, and... I hope I'll be able to tell you guys some things about the island that you didn't know. I hope so too. And it looks like Stu's looking forward to some more of those 30,000 foot cocktails that hopefully on the way there and the way back. <laughs> you know, it's it's been very interesting trying to make those. If, if you guys follow me, then um, I, uh, I know you guys um, <laughs> have seen these, but um, I make drinks in planes and take a picture on the window um, and you know, to reiterate, you cannot take your own liquor on a plane ever. Um, so anytime I make these, I take all the modifiers and I take the garnish and I take the glass, but then I get ice and liquor from them. Um, so just reiterating, don't try it at home <laughs> that way. Um, but it's been very interesting trying to make them and because I just have to take little airplane bottles and I don't open them. I just stick it in the top and hope that nobody yells at me. <laughs> I actually, are you taking Southwest down to Hawaii? I have some drink coupons that I probably won't use, so I can give them to you. <laughs> Ta -da! Well, thank you again, Susie, so much for your time today. It's been wonderful getting to collaborate with you, not only in our friendship, but then also in our work lives. For those of you who want to tune in to the next episode, we're going to be focusing on champagne myths for April Fool's Day. So don't forget to tune in for that. I've put in the link to the website and also to our YouTube channel. Um, this episode, if you want to share it with your friends, will hopefully be up by tomorrow um, if I can keep myself moving <laughs> on track. But it's been so wonderful to get to see all of you and, of course, to answer all of your questions. Cannot wait to make these cocktails. And hopefully, Susie, you and I will get to see you. I will get to see you before you leave for Hawaii. <laughs> Yes, of course. And thanks everybody for tuning in. Really loved having everybody here and getting to do this. Thanks guys. Absolutely. Thank you everybody.